Today our guest is John Smith, who is with us from Denver, Colorado. All right, and we're encourage we want to encourage our listeners to share experiences anonymously, which they can uh, if they want to make outreach. Uh, if you prefer, you can email us again at that empower one at proton.me. Uh, we're also looking for volunteers on our team to assist with day-to-day -day functions, editing, as this the Empower podcast is run by healthcare professionals for healthcare professionals and is now available on Spotify, music, uh, Apple Music, YouTube, and your, uh, your platform of your choice. So please, let's get ready. If you can, after following us on your platform of your choice, please sit back, be yourself no matter what, and get ready to be empowered. Uh, John, would you like to give a big thank you? This is part of the show where we give a big thank you at the beginning of the show to all the healthcare workers, uh, everyone out there that's making a difference. Whoever you are, wherever you are, you're truly number one. You know who you are. We love you. Uh, and if there's anybody you want to give a shout out to, especially, and you don't have to, if you don't want to, that's fine too. And you could also, if you want to give shout outs on the show too, still uh, email us at the Empower uh, email. All right. Would you like to? We're going to give a big shout out for a thank you to everybody in the healthcare field. Ready on three. One, two, three. Thank, thank you. you. All right. So we're going to click off here with an interview here of you, John, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us a little bit about you, your passion for your profession, how you found that kind of passion within healthcare? And uh, yeah, we'll just start off there. If that's all right. Um, I've been a registered nurse for eight years in the Denver area. Um, I initially became a nurse. I had been a nurse aide for quite a few years before becoming a nurse. I guess that's really what led me to my current position. Um, and what's what was the next question? Uh, let's tell, us, tell us a little bit about your passion for the profession. Um, what kind of drew you into healthcare? Uh, I always been a people person uh like working with people uh i had worked a lot of jobs that were uh not centered really around people or customer service or patient care type of work um i had done a lot of transportation and more technical work before getting into this so i knew that that was not the type of work i wanted to do forever so um but yeah i i do i still do get uh, satisfaction from my job. Oh. So did you like have anybody like within your social structure, maybe that was in the healthcare field that kind of gave you that kind of experience to maybe have a passion or a draw for it? Or... Uh, yeah, when I was a CNA, I, I worked with um, some really good nurses and uh, they really got me interested more in, in going further into healthcare. You want to tell us what year that was? Uh, that would have been 2012. Oh, all right. Yeah. I had just graduated high school, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, a little bit. You know, sorry, you're before, you're before, <laughs> but still. All right. So this is the part, uh, Chris. I want to tell you this. From what you've told me so far, uh, I want to tell you this. I have a feeling you're an empowered healthcare professional, mm -hmm. uh, John. You definitely are. So with that, I, I want to bring it just really straight to the point here. What, in your opinion, is really help happening in healthcare? Not only with you, but what what do you see that's really happening? Um, there's just a, a lot of issues with resources and staff. Um, also really a lot of places it seems like management is, it's very loose. There's no, no one really has the reins and there's no one really leading, um, you know, leading the healthcare team. And, uh, you know, another problem is call offs, but people, a lot of people, I don't believe have, an, you know, enough incentive you know, sometimes to go to work, I, I believe. And sometimes, you know, I guess a rebuttal for that would be, well, you go to work for your paycheck, but when your paycheck and, you know, the cost of living and the increase in living and the rise in the cost of living of Especially all... Especially within Colorado. And right, area. right. Within the last, like, three years, I mean, you, you're going to have to pay people to come work this job enough to provide for their family. Otherwise, it's not worth their time. And you're going to have... You're going to have the you know, staffing problems. Uh, it's not that people can't do the job or don't want to do it. It's just that it's a lot of places really aren't offering, you know, the pay to, to their full-time staff that they should be. And they're hiring temp people who come and go. And that's really, you know, it's not really best for, uh, for the patients. And like the place I was just recently working, 
there would be a 12 hour shift where we would have one nurse from about 6 a.m. to 9 or 10 a.m. Another nurse would be in from like 10 a.m. to like noon. And then I was the nurse from noon to six. I mean, it's just the continuity of care. It, it's just, it's just that people, no one wants to work a whole 12 hour shift. And it really affects, you know, the people who really end up being affected more than anyone is, you know, are the patients. So, and, and would you say like the patient overall experience too? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, um, people just have to wait a lot longer than really they should have to. I mean, it, it, on on not not on all, all kinds of things. It's not just pain management that that's really thrown out the door. It's uh, you know dressing changes that just don't ever get done. Uh, re resources, you know, admitting patients with COPD. Uh, you know, they're on five liters or six liters of oxygen coming from the hospital to a subacute setting, and when you get there. They have orders for breathing treatments. They've been getting them for days, and then we don't have a nebulizer in the building. You know, things like this, you know, it it's it really puts a nurse in a very dangerous position because, you know, you can do everything right yourself, but if if the building you're working in isn't giving you the basics, the this the essentials to do the job, you know, it's it's basically like having a loaded gun put to your head. You know, you have to hope everything goes right because otherwise you're 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 gonna have some issues. So, uh, you say it would also like set you up for failure. That's mainly like your employer setting you up for failure even before you go in for your shift, right? Yes. Even yeah. to the point where like, uh, I'm gonna interject here, but like, like there's tactics out there that I'm noticing that like healthcare professionals use mm -hmm. mainly like that. And it doesn't matter whatever whether they're in if they're their agency or staff now, or if people come in late anticipating being able to for these challenges, and it's because they're present. They're they're going to these kinds of extremes of behaviors and. And it's, it's hostile. Yeah. That's what I feel like it really truly is, is it's a hostile work environment before you even clock in. It is. Mm -hmm. And you know, who doesn't really get to see it or they know it or they sense it. In my opinion, the patient. Yeah. They do. They hear a lot of it too. But a lot of them listen around the nurse station. Do you have any like, <laughs> like current maybe like, or like incidents where like you kind of mentioned today, some of the stuff um, <clears throat> with management and all this kind of stuff where it kind of, when something happened, Mm -hmm. And you saw that it happened. It maybe it could have been handled better, or maybe that it was handled well. I mean, recently, uh, just um, uh, recently, I was I I worked through a temp agency as well here in the Denver area, and I went into a shift um, for a built to a building, and it was a long term care facility, which I hadn't really worked in in quite a number of years full time. But through a temp agency, I do go to them from time to time. Never been to this one before. Or actually, no, I had been once before, but I worked in a different area. But this time they wanted me to take a cart and they wanted me to take on 33 patients. And, you know, there were a multitude. I can't, I don't want to sp say specifically because I can't remember, but there were a multitude of lawyer lifts on this hallway, a multitude of feeders. I mean, just people who need a okay, lot of for those assistance. Who don't know what is what is a, a feeder? Would you say this this is like a, uh, a high patient load? Would you consider? Yes, yeah. I mean, it was not patients. Sorry. It was people who basically needed help to do absolutely everything. I mean, they absolutely totally dependent. Yeah, you say. pretty much. Yeah, I mean, you have a few people who can get by on you know with a walker in a chair and sort of help themselves. And out of thirty three of them, you know, you might have had a handful that could self transfer themselves. But it was a very heavy hallway, and. Um, when I went in, I, I actually, you know, I called the director of nursing and I told her, you know, I really, I want the shift. I need the hours. I'm here because I want to work. I woke up at four 30 in the morning to come take care of these people. I, I wanted the hours and I, you know, I was there to do my job. Um, so I talked to her on the phone for a few minutes about, you know, maybe what we could, you know, what could possibly be done, you know, with, with the patient load, you know, I said 33 of, of this type of patient is a lot. If, you know, if you want to take 22 or if you you want me to take 22 of these patients and maybe you come in and take 11, you know, that would be, that would really, I would feel safe that way. You know, I feel like it, I wouldn't be putting myself in a very dangerous position. So she really kind of scoffed at the idea. And um, I, you know, after that, I, after, you know, that I kind of realized she didn't really want to hear me talk anymore. So uh, I was told I was not welcome back at the facility. And I simply told her that, uh, you know, I didn't blame her and that in her position, I guess I would have to do the same thing, but I'm not in her position. I still work at the bedside and, you know, I have to go by a certain, you know, code for myself when I go into do a situation, you know, I'm, I am trying to make a living, but 
has to be, you know, reasonable. It has to be a reasonable situation. I mean, some of these places, people know that there's just, there aren't needs being met and things just get overlooked. I mean, uh, you know, you have all these different types of assessments that are supposed to be done on a patient in any single day, you know, in a subacute setting, but it, it, it becomes damn near impossible to do it when, when you're getting three and four admissions at one time, three and four discharges as the admissions are coming in. Uh, it's, cer it's certainly not something that great talented people can't handle working wise, but when there's not enough talent on the floor to do it. And there was a shortage of healthcare professionals, mainly nurses, even prior to COVID. Right. Too. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so when you, when you add all, all that together, it just creates a recipe for a lot of burnout, a lot of call offs, and a lot of people trying to really see what they can do with their time besides healthcare. And then the other thing too, I want to mention too, is we both know that healthcare professionals are two to three times more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol than the general public. Right. Yeah. And in a stressful environment, that can be something to have. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if you had time to potentially look over the legislation that was made for the, uh, the wellness act when it came to, um, the quarterly, I didn't know if for you, mm -hmm. uh, Maybe if it was if the system was changed over from a uh, into a quarterly system, if you had a minimum of two wellness days, it was financially backed by your employer. Would you agree with that? Uh, that would be yeah. And to support it, yeah. Be penalties for them too if they didn't uphold this. Yeah, that would be a good idea. But two, mm -hmm. you probably need more than two, really, a quarter. It's a, it's a minimum of two. Right. Yeah. From what I read in the legislation, like you're able to file for an extension, you're able to ask for more there's at least if you give 14 days notice you're allowed to ask for them too it's uh it's a minimum of eight per year hmm. so yeah and that can happen and occur at any time let's say you were in a patient's room and mm -hmm. the patient passed away mm -hmm. and you were just needed to step away for the day take bereavement they call it bereavement this is not this is separate from your bereavement right. this is separate from sick time right separate from everything else that previously exists right so and you can use it in conjunction but do you think with that in that kind of a situation if you were to go in with a patient load like that First of all, would you try to see if you make a difference like you did? Like you spoke um, to the Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 to make it work? right. I wanted the hours. I was not, I know some. And this led to you not making your right, living. Yeah. Right. I mean, I was there for about 20 minutes trying to, to I guess, we'll haggle. What time again? 4 30 in the morning okay. to make the shift. So I, 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 did, I wasn't wanting to come home. I, you know, I wanted the hours. What so, was your commute to this job? Um, it was about 20, 25 minutes. Okay. All right. Anyways, uh, in addition, uh, have you heard of an HSA account? Are you familiar? I have heard of them, yes. Have you utilized it with your employers ever? If you I, mind sharing personally, yeah. I have not, no. Okay, if it, if you had in there loaded, let's say, $2,000 from your employer per quarter in addition mm -hmm. to those two minimum that you could use for whatever necessities you need for your wellness, right? would you be up for a system like that? Yeah, I would Other improvements that. in other areas. I'm obviously improving, but I'm trying to mm -hmm. see, at least with the purpose of this podcast, is to get this legislation passed so we at least have this. Mm -hmm. And there's another clause within it that it could actually even um, have its actual actions implemented prior to it being passed. And some legislation that currently exists already does that from what I'd read up on. But I also want to revisit back to the notes here too. Because I, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that you're still, you're still keeping your job. You're still wanting to look out for the patient, even though you know what is happening. And that's what the general question I asked you too, is in your opinion, you know, what in healthcare is happening, you know, mm -hmm. um, after today, the way healthcare is, do you want to continue in your current occupation? I do. Yes. I want to continue, uh, working, but no more than 40 hours a week. That's really what I can do at right. this point. Not be pressured through money and or, uh, micro, kind of tactics right. that they would use to kind of incentivize you to, especially within conditions that you're talking about. Do, do, have you seen a correlation between those kinds of conditions and higher pay? Um, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I think that, you know, generally speaking, yeah, the more you're willing to give to them, the more they're willing to give to you money wise. And, and then within the uh, Denver area of it, this one facility you talked about with the high patient load that you were offered, is that the only facility you've had that you've seen that at? Uh, no, it's happened uh, other in other spots, uh, not so much recently because I haven't been working temp temp work a whole lot recently. But um, it has, yeah. I mean, there's been places I've walked in and I, you know, I had to to sort of, you know, basically not not take the keys of the car to report because 
you know, just being asked to really take on more than one nurse can handle. So I just, you know, another, another instance, I guess it happened about a year and a half ago, I went into a facility speaking of just like on the resource side of things, like went into the, to the building. It was very warm. It was like the latter part of June. It was probably close to a hundred degrees um, here in Denver. And the building I went in and it was very warm, but the further into the building I went, the warmer it got. By the time I got to the back of this uh, subacute rehab, uh, the back of the building, it was probably 80 something degrees in the building. Everybody was perspiring profusely. Staff looked like they had been showering. Uh, they had all these fans moving, which were, do were just moving hot air around. And I have chronic health issues. So I basically told them I wasn't going to take the shift. They were very upset. But I said, look, you know, I cannot become dehydrated. Uh, clearly working in this environment, I'm going to very quickly become dehydrated. So I think it was, you know, when I look back, you know, I was looking out for my own health situation I because I can't afford to become dehydrated. But they had a real heating, ventilation, air conditioning problem. And those patients were, that had to affect some of those people, especially the, the more frail ones, because it was extremely warm in that building. Was it reported? Um, I reported it to my uh, agency. And what happened? Yeah. Um, they got me a shift at a, another facility about uh, 10 miles away. Okay, hold on. So and this still happened the facility you're at. You called your agency, and then they said, we're just going to float you to another facility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the other facility, and the other facility uh, was air conditioning and staffed, and it was, it had the essentials, so I took the shift. Did you ever go back? Uh, not to the facility that was 85, 86 degrees. Yeah. No. Did they say anything back to you? Like, did you get any other feedback? Uh, what happened? No, or nobody, it just faded out? Nobody complained. No, no one could blame me, really. Okay, but you never went back. Okay, I never did. No. I got you. Okay, cool. Um, so here's the next part. Um, this part's for kind of like the new grads, the people that are in school, people that are considering healthcare. Um, what would be like an empowering piece of advice for someone looking to go into maybe your kind of line of work, or that maybe you've worked alongside? Like, and you can include like questions to ask, like prior to employment, uh, look things to look for on the job nowadays to continue yeah. Um, to drive through that passion today that you you have and that you possess, what would you say? Um, uh, can you repeat that question? Sure, sure, no problem. So, like, what would be like some empowering, like an empowering piece of advice, or like some knowledge or wisdom, I guess, that you could pass along to someone in school that's looking to go into your kind of line of work? You know, like, can you include like maybe questions to ask you prior to your employment? You know, or things to ask while you're still in school to your teachers or things to look for on the job nowadays, you know, while you're in for your floating or whatnot, or even for the general public too, things to look for in facilities, mm -hmm. you know, before you would kind of have your family go to these kinds of facilities uh, anywhere. And this kind of stuff happens all throughout healthcare, folks, you know, it, it, and it happens in any industry too. I mean, there's people within the AC industry, I've seen it online where there's uh, OSHA and different regulations that get violated and whatnot. So it happens. It's part of the system. That's why we have departments set up that are supposed to regulate this. Um, anyways, yes. What's an empowering piece of advice for someone looking to go into your line of work? Um, or I would say definitely, especially if you're a student, uh, spend a lot of time in the healthcare setting while you're in school because um, it, it's something uh the the textbook aspect of it is is one thing but to to you know the the actual act of 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 uh the job is is much different than than what you learn in school uh a lot of what you learn in school is is very helpful um but putting it into practice basically is something every individual has to learn for themselves that can't really be taught and so uh, i would say it's very important to to not go into a nursing position having just passed an NCLEX and never worked a day as a CNA or, a, you know, a med tech or, uh, or don't expect upset if, right. if you haven't done that. Right. 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 Or been an EMT or any of these other positions that a lot of people come from before they end up as a nurse. Um, I guess another thing I would advise, uh, uh, people looking to get into nursing, um, you know, I would say if it's, if it's strictly, an income thing. There's lots of professions that pay about sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year, um, and that would probably 
be sufficient if that's what you're looking for. They don't, however, offer the overtime that you get as a registered nurse. As a registered nurse, you have tremendous overtime potential if if you want it. Um, you can really basically double your income uh, if you really choose to. So, you know, that's just something to know uh, before you get into it. But, uh, you know, if you're really looking to make more than just, you know, a certain amount, I, I mean, if you're really looking to maximize an income, you're not going to have the overtime opportunities in many fields that you're going to have in nursing. I, I don't, not on, not on a consistent basis. Nursing, you know, if you want to work 16 hours a day, seven days a week, you can. I wouldn't recommend that though. I want to thank you. Uh, so I also want to include this. According to the report by the National Nurses United, uh, nurses across the United States uh, during COVID reported that they lacked adequate PPE and were forced to reuse single use equipment and were also were denied the necessary testing and diagnosis of COVID-19. Uh, despite these challenges, nurses continue to inspire us with their resilience compassion and dedication to their profession. In honor of Nurses Week, we invite all healthcare professionals to call in or email us and give a shout out to nurses in their lives. Anybody, whether you're a health professional or not, you can email us again at that empower1 at proton.me. We want to close here. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Thomas, before we close? Um, I guess, yeah, to be more specifically, I, like, I guess I would like to thank all the healthcare professionals who work through covid and I also like to specifically thank anybody in healthcare who, um, you know, remained pro-choice through, through a lot of what was going on during COVID. So, but really, thanks to everybody who worked the bedside, no matter what uh, their personal views on COVID were. Yeah, thanks to anyone who worked the bedside during COVID. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, John. Uh, we're going to close here with a quote from Mary Eliza Mahoney, the first African-American registered nurse, and that is, the very first requirement in a hospital uh, is that it should do the sick no harm. I want to thank you for tuning in to the Empower podcast. Thank you again, John, for being with us. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Stay empowered, everyone, and happy Nurses Week. Bye for now. <laughs>